webinar with Mr. Geoff Domini. Geoff is the founder and CEO of the World Gem Foundation, creator of Colorwise, founder and editor of Gemology. He has been teaching since 1987, and today he is the CEO of Amazonas Gem Publications and many other. We at Gem Atlas are glad to have Mr. Geoff talk about how to value colored gemstones. Gem Atlas is a global B2B networking platform for the diamonds, gems, and jewelry industry. We help you connect with business and professionals around the world. You can easily start generating new business leads through our platform. There will be a Q&A button. Please feel free to enter your questions below and have them answered at the end of the session. Over to you, Mr. Gio. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome from, well, not so sunny Spain today. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, how we value uh, colored gemstones. Um, with you, I'd like to jump right in um, and uh, let me tell you how we value colored gemstones. So during today's presentation, um, I want to talk to you about what we mean by value. Uh, we're going to cover some basic color uh, theory. We're going to look at grading colored gemstones, different systems and different approaches. We're going to look at how to read price lists and more importantly, how we actually understand the quality classifications. Uh, we're gonna look at treatments and enhancements. And we're also gonna look at a, quite a contentious issue, which is the country of origin. So before we start, I would like to dispel two um, misconceptions. Uh, when I started in the industry in 1980 and when I started appraising in 1987, I honestly believed that there was this little magic black book out there that everyone consulted when it came to the pricing of actual gemstones and jewelry. Well, I was wrong on that particular one. The reality is that uh, a person can sell an item for whatever price they want, uh, as long as the market will sustain that price. So for example, if you are a jeweler on Fifth Avenue in New York, you will be able to charge more for your product than let's say a smaller jeweler in a Midwest town. The second misconception that, that we have is that for any item, there is only one price. Well, in actual fact, for any item, there are multiple prices based on the purpose of the valuation. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's use an example. Let's look at this Cartier ring. Now, in terms of a price, a retail price, it's quite simple. We can go onto uh, the Cartier website. Uh, we can go into a Cartier store here in Europe um, and they will tell us that the price is 3,750 euros. But that's not the only price for this particular ring. Let's say, for example, that you own this ring and for some reason you decide to sell this ring. Will you sell that ring for 3,750 euros? No. Would I buy that ring off you for 3,750 euros? Absolutely not. I would go into a Cartier store to buy it. So we have a second value, which is a second hand value in a secondary market. Now, of course, branded items like Cartier pieces will have a better resale value, but the reality is they're going to have a resale value which is lower than the actual retail price. Now, let's say, for example, that you, uh, you have some financial problems and you don't want to sell the ring, but you actually want to loan money against the ring. You want to use the ring as collateral. So you go to a friend or perhaps you go to a business. What will they give you for that particular ring? Well, they certainly won't give you 3,750 uh, euros for it. They certainly won't give you a secondary market price. Because remember, if something happens and you can't repay, they're going to have to liquidate this ring. And so they're gonna offer you a price that is lower than the actual secondary market price. But let's say, for example, that we take this ring and we take the diamonds out and we melt the gold down. Now we have a lump of 18 karat gold and we have 22 points of diamonds. What is the value there? Well, the value, is going to be approximately 550 euros. Why? Well, first of all, we've taken out the branding of the item. It's no longer a Cartier piece. We've taken out the retail market. We've taken out the wholesale market. We've taken out the labor. 
we now have the intrinsic value of the metals and the actual gemstones. So it's very important to understand that there are multiple prices when it comes to an item based on the purpose of the evaluation. And in this particular situation, that price can range anywhere from 550 euros up to 3,750 euros. But you are here today to talk about colored gemstones. So let's start talking about uh, colored gemstones. So if we wanted to value this particular room, what do we need to know? Well, first of all, we have to obviously establish the purpose of the valuation. But after that, there are six important things that we actually need to, um, that we need to focus on. The first thing is, sorry, first thing is color. Now, I suspect that if you are buying a colored stone, that you are probably buying it because of the color. Um, you may be buying it because it's your birthstone, but I think the primary motivation for buying a colored stone is the color. Now, some people will tell you that the color is worth up to 70% of the value. Uh, I can tell you that in some cases, the color is worth even more than that. But color is a very, very important consideration when it comes to the value of any colored gemstone, especially the main gemstones such as rubies, sapphires, and emeralds, and now Pareba tourmalines as well. The second consideration is the clarity. I want you to imagine that we have two rubies that are exactly the same. The only difference is that one is lightly included and one is moderately included. Which ruby is worth more? Well, I think that 99.9% .9 of the people would agree that the lightly included ruby should command a higher price than the moderately included. The cut. Now, when I started in the industry in 1980, 42 years ago, uh, we didn't care about the cut of color gemstones. All we cared about was the color and weight retention. And then longer came uh, some wonderfully talented people like Victor Tuzlukov, uh, John Dyer, uh, Michael Dyber, uh, a whole host of very talented cutters who started to show us the importance of cut, not just in diamonds, but how it related to colored gemstones as well. And especially in lighter colored materials where brilliance becomes a factor. The fourth thing that we need to factor in is the carat weight. Again, if I have two rubies that are exactly the same, one weighs four carats and one weighs three carats, clearly the four carat stone should be worth more not just in terms of weight, but in terms of price per carat, because it is harder to find a four carat, let's say extra fine ruby, uh, than it is to find a three carat stone. But there are some other factors that we also need to factor in as well. Uh, is the stone treated? Now, we'll get into this a little bit later on, because again, this is a bit of a contentious issue, but this is something that we have to factor in when we're actually valuing the stone. And we also have to factor in the origin. Now, I'm not just talking about whether it's a natural stone or a lab created stone. I'm talking about where the actual stone comes from. With diamonds, we can't tell where a diamond comes from unless we follow the chain of warranties. But with colored stones, oftentimes we can tell the country of origin. Now, the question is, is this important? Well, yes, because if we look at the price difference between a non-origin five carat extra fine ruby and a similar quality from Myanmar or from Burma, Burmese stone, according to Gem Guide, there is a 622,000 US dollar difference between the two stones at wholesale. Yes, you heard me correctly, 622,000 US dollars difference. So absolutely, country of origin is something that we really need to be conscious of. So let's talk about color. Color is an important part of all of our lives. And it's particularly important when obviously it comes to colored gemstones and the valuation and pricing of colored gemstones. So just a little bit of, of, of color theory. When it comes to gemology, we're looking at uh, two types of stones. We're looking at transparent stones and opaque stones. And each of these stones handle light differently. So for example, in a transparent stone, what happens is that light enters the stone 
and certain wavelengths are absorbed while other wavelengths are freely transmitted. So when we look at this ruby, it appears red because the wavelengths that are freely transmitted will combine together to give us this sensation of red. But what about in opaque stones? Clearly light cannot be transmitted through an opaque stone. So in this case, the light that actually hits the surface of the stone is either absorbed by the stone or reflected back to the And I tell all of my students that a greatest goal is consistency, consistency, consistency. We will all have slight variances of opinion when it comes to actual color grading. We all perceive color slightly differently. But the most important thing is that we are consistent in our grade. So the key question is, if I were to give you this amethyst today, a week from now, a year from now, five years from now, would you grade it the same way? Because my friends, if you don't grade it the same way, you're not going to value it the same way. So how can we ensure consistency? Well, one of the key things that we need to do is we need to control the grading environment. How do we do that? Well, remember I just talked about light, how it interacts with transparent and opaque stones. Light is one of the key things that we need to control. When it comes to light, we deal in, in light temperature in Kelvins. And you can see here by this graphic that, oh, I'm sorry that if we lower the Kelvins, it becomes more yellow in color. And if we increase the Kelvins, it becomes whiter to the point where it becomes more of a bluish white. Now, I want to tell you a funny story. Well, actually it wasn't that funny when it happened to me, but it's, it's sort of funny now. Uh, in 1996, I was in Sri Lanka, I was buying stones and uh, I bought this very nice ruby one and a half carats. I got it back to Vancouver. I was quite excited about it because uh, the price was very good and I really felt that I could make some good money off the stone. I opened up the stone parcel and to my horror, it wasn't red. It was more orange than red. Now, of course, my first reaction was somebody had switched the stone, but no, it was the exact stone that I had actually purchased. So why was it appearing red in Sri Lanka, and why is it, was it now appearing orangey red, more orange than red, when I was in Vancouver? Well, my friends, what I didn't know then, which I wish I had known, was that based on the temperature of light, different gemstones will appear differently. So for example, if we look at um, light that's 3,200 to 4,600 Kelvins, which is more of a yellowish color, that will actually um, make reds become a truer red. It will remove some of the purple from the purplish reds. It will intensify the yellow color. And it will also make darker blue and purple stones appear slightly lighter. So you can see here from a selling standpoint, the type of light that we use, the amount of Kelvins we use can seriously impact on how the buyer is going to view those stones. At the same token, the buyer needs to be very much aware of what type of temperature they, what they need when they're making that buying decision is they may need to make a proper decision based on what the actual color is. So from a grading standpoint, we recommend using a neutral uh, light source, which is between 5,000 and 5,500 Kelvins. Uh, so that we avoid this situation that happened to me um, and probably has happened to a lot of people over, over the years. Now, the, the problem with, with colored gemstone grading is that unless we are both viewing the same stone under the same lighting conditions, our perception of color is not going to be the same. So in terms of controlling the environment, we have to ensure that we are working with the same type of lighting so that we get consistency in our actual color grade. But what are some of the other factors that affect our perception of color? Well, the grading environment. You can see here in my office that I have neutral colored walls. Imagine if I had red walls or blue walls, 
that is going to actually affect my perception of the actual color. My clothing is actually going to affect my perception of the color. The gemstones that are associated with the particular gemstone that I'm grading, for example, if I'm looking at a ring and I have a blue stone and a yellow stone in there, the yellow stone is going to affect my perception of the blue and the blue stone is going to somehow or somewhat affect my perception of the actual yellow. The other important thing is the physical condition of the actual grader. Now, if you are out uh, late last night uh, drinking, I can tell you right now that your perception of the actual color is going to be quite different. So this is another factor that we need to um, be very careful of is our physical condition. In terms of the color grading systems that are currently out there in the marketplace, there are many different systems, but all the systems basically have three things in common. The first thing is they will talk about primary and secondary hues. The second thing is they will talk about the vividness of the actual color. And the third thing they'll talk about is how light or how dark the actual color is. So let's talk about primary and secondary hues. Uh, Color-wise, have 31 uh, primary and secondary hues in their actual color wheel. And I don't know if you know this, but color is based on degrees. So red is zero degrees, orange is 30 degrees, yellow is 60 degrees, green is 120 degrees, blue is 240 degrees, violet is 270 degrees, and purple is 300 degrees. Now you can see here that between red at zero degrees and orange at 30 degrees, we have three intermediate hues. I developed color-wise so it would be uh, consistent with what GIA are doing. So the same 31 hues that, that they use. But I, I need you to understand that every time we change a degree, every time we change a fraction of a degree, we create a new hue. So if we look at diamond grading, for example, where we have 10 major clarity grades and 10 major color grades, we often find even between experienced graders, it's very hard to get a consensus. Imagine how hard it is to get a consensus with color gemstones, where there are millions of possibilities in terms of the actual hues and the saturation and also uh, how light or how dark it is. So when we talk about saturation, we're actually referring to the intensity or the vividness of the color. So you can see here by this graphic, I've given you five examples of saturation. Now, the important thing here to understand is that these are the same hue and the same lightness levels. The only thing that I have changed is the saturation level. But for all intents and purposes, we are looking at five different colors. Now, the question is, uh, can a gemstone have too much saturation? Well, the answer is no. Uh, you can see here that if we look at the 100%, we've got a nice vivid color. And if we look at the 20%, we have quite a dull color. So the answer is no, we can never have enough saturation in the stone. And when we look at the top quality stones, uh, they will always have a very vivid saturation. In terms of lightness, again, what I've done here is I've given you seven examples of lightness. But again, I've only changed one of the variables. So the only difference here is the lightness levels. So the hue and the saturation are exactly the same. Again, it looks like we're looking at seven different colors. And if we look at the medium 50%, this is the true blue. Every, every other one that's shown on this screen is a variation of that because we have changed the actual lightness levels. So how do we determine the quality? Well, if we look at this uh, price list, which was actually taken from uh, Gem Guide, we can see that we're faced with a lot of numbers. And what we need to do is we need to qualify what these numbers actually mean. Some of them are self-explanatory. For example, if we see here the actual weights in carats, uh, these numbers here 
Well, we can assume that they are actual prices, but we do need to qualify in what currency they are. And are they price per carat or are they price per stone? Um, normally, we're dealing with uh, a price per carat. But the key to unlocking this particular price grid is understanding the quality classifications. So what do we mean by commercial good fine and extra fine? And what do we mean by the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10? And you may be sitting there saying, well, why do we care? Well, let's have a look at the difference in the prices. If we have a five carat stone that is, uh, has a quality classification of one, it's gonna be selling for $400 a carat. But if we have that same stone in an extra fine 10 quality, it's going to be selling for $8,500 a carat. So yes, we need to actually understand what we mean by these terms and what we mean by these different numbers. So how do we determine the quality classification? Well, earlier I talked about the ruby. What things do we need to understand in terms of the ruby? Well, we're going to need to develop a color score. The second thing is we're going to need to make an adjustment for the clarity. And then we're also going to need an adjustment for the actual cut. Let's start out with how we actually um, come up with the color score. So there are different systems out there. Um, at the World Gem Foundation, we teach four systems. Two of them are print systems and two of them are digital systems. Uh, one of the print systems is a system called Gem Dialog. Uh, within that system, there are 45 hues, 10 zones, and 10 color masks. Now, in reality, in their actual book, they actually have 21 hues, uh, and the user uh, is required to use some imagination in terms of coming up with the other 24 hues. If we look at the world of color, this is another printed system. They have 40 hues, they have 18 levels of chroma or saturation, and they have 10 levels of value or tone. Moving on to the digital systems, we have the GIA and Jemmy Wizard. Jemmy Wizard, for all intents and purposes, is a digital version of the GIA system. And within their system, they have 31 hues, they have six levels of saturation, and they have between 11 and seven levels of tone. Now, why is there a difference there? Well, quite simply, if we look at a stone that is very dark or black or very light or colorless, do we really need to grade those stones for color? So with the Jenny Wizard system, they decided to remove four of those uh, and go with the seven uh, levels of, uh, of tone. The other uh, digital system, which I created last year, which is called Colorwise, it has 31 hues, which is consistent with the GIA Jemmy Wizard system. It has five levels of saturation and it has seven levels of lightness. Now, the ultimate goal here is that if we look at these two stones, if we look at this Pareva Tourmaline, this gorgeous Pareva Tourmaline and this blue sapphire, the goal here is to grade the color. So if, for example, we were using the colorwise system, we would grade the Pareva Tourmaline as green, blue, blue, green, meaning equal amounts of, of green and blue, 100% saturation, 50% lightness. And if we were grading this gorgeous blue sapphire, we would grade it as blue with 100% saturation and 40% lightness. Now, why do we need this information? Well, for two reasons. Number one, for communication. So let's say, for example, I'm talking to my friend Michael in, in the States. Hi, Michael. Um, and I am trying to communicate to him what this blue sapphire looks like. Now, we get a lot of terminology in the industry, uh, pigeon blood red, cashmere blue. Um, these are historic terms, and they're, they're wonderful terms. There's a real romance to these particular terms. But in reality, one man's pigeon blood red is very different to another man's pigeon blood red. So, uh, we need to be a little bit more scientific in our description. So if I have a stone um, and we're both working with the same system, I can say to Michael, this is a blue hue, 100% saturation, 40% lightness. And he at least has a pretty good idea of what this stone is going to look like. So no surprises when the stone arrives um, and crosses his desk. 
The other thing, the reason that we need to establish the hue tone and the saturation or the hue saturation and lightness, depending on which uh, color model we're working with, is that ultimately we need to come up with a color score. So if we're looking at the world of color, we can see that if a stone matches their 10 RP hue, if a stone has a, uh, a four tone, and if a stone has a 14 or a 16 level of saturation, that that stone will be graded as a 10. Okay. Now, my friends, you can't get better than the 10. So in terms of the world of color system, they are, they are telling us that a ruby that is a 10 RP with a tonal level of four and a saturation level of between 14 and 16 is going to be a 10. If we look at the GIA Gemi Wizard system, the Gemi Wizard system is an interactive system. Um, it's uh, very user friendly. You simply plug in all of the information. You don't have to do any calculations at all. Go off and have a cup of coffee, come back, and it will tell you um, the actual grading of that particular stone. With ColorWise, it's a little bit different. If you click on the actual color score icon, it will take you to a page that looks like this. Um, and you can see here that we have the, uh, the hue, the saturation, and the lightness. And we also have stones with numbers behind them. Now, these are all numbers that have been correlated to the GIA system. So this is not ColorWise saying these scores. This is not me saying these scores. This is GIA. And GIA have developed these scores based on the market, what the market expects, what the market wants in terms of colored gemstones. So in terms of GIA, they will tell you that a ruby that is red with 100% saturation and 40% lightness is a 10. Now, if we look above that, we can see that a ruby that is red has 100% saturation, but now we've just changed the lightness by 10%. So we've gone from a 40% lightness to a 50% lightness. The score drops from a 10 to an 8.5. Now, again, you may be looking at and saying, well, who cares? Well, my friends, we should care about that because dropping that score, increasing the lightness of that stone by 10%, is going to have a dramatic effect on the actual value. So again, if we go back to our five carat Burmese unenhanced ruby, by simply changing the lightness by 10%, we are going to affect a 248,750 US dollar difference in the wholesale price of that particular stone. Now, talk to anyone that works in a lab and they will tell you there's enormous pressure on them. Uh, to label a stone with those seven magical letters, Burmese or Myanmar. They're both seven, seven letters. And you can see why when you see these astronomical differences in the prices. Now, one of the problems that we, that we get, and I alluded to this earlier with, with trying to commun uh, communicate with my friend, is that unfortunately, all these different systems use different languages. So, Remember, there are two things that we want to achieve with, with any color grading system, uh, communication, but also uh, how we value things. So if we look here, we can see that between the four systems, they all use different terminology and that can be confusing. So if somebody's working with the world of color and somebody's working with gem dialogue and they're talking about how light or how dark stone is, one is talking in terms of value and tone. The other one is talking in terms of, of color mask. This is a big problem in, in our industry, um, not being able to communicate with each other because we're all using different systems. In an effort to try and, and improve that, I've come up with a correlation a chart, um, which allows users of GIA or Jenny Wizard, ColorWise and the world of color to at least communicate with each other. A couple of years ago, I did a presentation in Alicante in Spain about the very same subject I'm talking about today, about the problems in color grading. I did the entire presentation in Spanish. Uh, no, I'm not that good in Spanish. I actually rehearsed for three months, um, but I nailed it. Uh, of course, I became unstuck when people, when the Q&A period uh, started because my Spanish wasn't that good. 
But my reason for doing that presentation entirely in Spanish was to get the point across that unless we are speaking the same language, we're not going to fully understand each other. So if I were doing this presentation right now in Spanish, the vast majority of you would not understand what I was saying. If you were a Spanish speaker, you probably wouldn't understand it either. Um, so it's very important that we find a way to communicate with each other, even if we're using different systems. Now, what complicates the matter even more is that if we look at the tonal chart for GIE and the tonal chart for the world of, uh, world of color, we can see they're in reverse order. So this means that the GIE tone two will be a very light stone, while a world of color tone two will be a very dark stone. This creates problems as well. Okay, so let's now talk about the second factor that we need to consider in, in terms of valuing a gemstone, clarity. With diamonds, I, I like to refer to diamonds as equal opportunity because I believe every diamond uh, is formed with an equal opportunity to be a D color flawless diamond. And if they're not, well, then obviously that is going to affect the value. Of them. But when we talk about colored gemstones, we're talking about a lot of different gemstones. We're talking about a lot of different growth environments. And we're also talking a lot of, about a lot of different rates of growth. Now, a little experiment, okay? When you go home tonight, I want you to take an ice cube tray and I want you to fill it with water and put it in the freezer of your refrigerator. Then I want you to take another ice cube tray. I also want you to fill it with water, but I want you to cover it with tin foil, with, with aluminum foil, and I want you to put it into the freezer. What you will find tomorrow when you open them both up is that the ice cube tray that you've covered with foil, the ice cubes will be cleaner, they'll be clearer than the tray that you put into the freezer without the covering. This is somewhat the same principle when we talk about colored gemstones. Some gemstones are products of rapid cooling. Some gemstones are products of slow cooling. This little exercise controls the cooling of, of, of the water, of turning it into ice. So a very little interesting little exercise, but a, a graphic reason why we get different gemstones with different clarities. Now, the GIA came up with a great system. They decided in order to level the playing field that they would come up with three clarity types, type one, type two, and type three. Type one stones are gemstones that typically we find without inclusions. More importantly, we don't want inclusions in these stones. And if we find inclusions in these stones, we need to uh, penalize these stones. So aquamarine, for example, uh, kunzite, uh, blue topaz, uh, blue green tourmaline. These are all examples of type one stones. Type two stones are stones where we will accept a moderate amount of inclusions. In fact, finding these stones without inclusions um, is, is a little bit harder. And type three stones are stones where we expect to find inclusions in them based on their growth environments. So what GIA are basically saying is that there's a greater tolerance for inclusions in type two and type three stones. So if we're looking at an emerald or we're looking at a red tourmaline and we're comparing that to an aquamarine, we can't compare them equally because they are both products of a different growth environment. Now, where I believe, in my opinion, GIA have made a bit of a mistake when it comes to the clarity grading of colored stones is that they came up with three, uh, actually they came up with five different clarity grades, um, but they had different descriptions based on the type. Okay. Now, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to level the playing field. But let me show you something which is quite peculiar about this particular chart in front of me. You can see here that we have the same description for three different types that actually ultimately give us three different clarity grades. So I want you to imagine for a second, we have an aquamarine, we have a ruby, and we have an emerald. They all have the exact same inclusion in the exact same place, but each of those stones will have a different clarity grade. One will be classed as heavily included, one as moderately included, 
one has slightly improved. So what is happening here? Well, basically GIA are asking the grader to reprogram their brain every single time they carry the grader colored gemstone. Now that's fine if you spend the morning working on aquamarines or on type one stones, you get into a rhythm. But what happens if you're working with a type one stone, then a type two stone, then a type one stone, then a type three stone? Is it feasible that a grader can switch gears all the time, can view the same inclusion, but grade it th three different ways? Um, I would say no. Um, and again, if our goal is to be consistent, then these types of things don't help us achieve that consistency. With color-wise, we grade it the way we see it. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether it's a type one, type two, or type three stone. If a stone appears clean to the unaided eye and has no inclusions under 10X, that stone, my friends, is an internally flawed stone. So we don't have to worry about the type. We're grading the stone for what it is. What we see is what we actually get on that particular stone. Now, having said that, we do need to level up the playing field. So in terms of uh, doing adjustments to the actual, uh, for the actual clarity, you can see here that with a type one stone, uh, we'll make no deductions if it's internally flawless, but as we start to get more inclusions in that stone, as we work down from slightly included to moderately included all the way down to heavily included three, we are actually lowering the score of that particular stone. We're penalizing that stone because we don't expect to see a type one stone that is heavily included. What I took the liberty of doing with ColorWise is tweaking the system just a little bit because there was no allowance for stones that were anomalous. So let me ask you a question. If we had two emeralds, exactly the same, I mean, exactly the same, and one was moderately included and one was internally flawless, do you not think that the internally flawless stone should be worth more? Well, my answer to you is absolutely. And I can tell you something that if you are the owner of that internally flawless stone, you will want that stone to be worth more. So we tweak the system there to uh, reward stones that are what we call anomalous. We don't find very often internally flawless emeralds, but what happens if we do? We need to have some system where we can actually um, make allowances for that. We also look at the transparency uh, or the texture, which is based on the inclusions. You know, we get a lot of rubies and sapphires that are, that are very heavily included with silk and it actually affects the transparency of the stone. Um, that is a negative in terms of, of, of a uh, ruby or a sapphire, which is one of the reasons why these stones are, are, are heat treated. So we need to make allowances for that. And we also need to make allowances for color zoning, although with color white, in a base position. There are some systems out there that advocate in positions of that is that a cutter has very often sacrificed to get the best appearance in the position. We don't clarity grade diamonds in a table down position through the pavilion. We only clarity in position. So in terms of the color-wise system, we are only interested in what we see in a face-up position. In terms of cut, remember earlier I was telling you when I started in 1980, we didn't care about cut. All we cared about was color and weight retention. But now there's more of an emphasis on how colored stones are cut. So we look at things like light performance, we look at proportionality, and we also look at finish. So you can see here by this chart that we will make deductions based on um, a lower amount of brilliance coming from the stone. You know, we get, we get different things in, in color stones. We get windows, which is a see-through effect where the light is leaking out through the bottom of the stone. We get areas of extinction, which are darker areas in the stone where light's not being returned to the eye. So we need to make allowances for this. You know, we need to reward the cutters that are doing a good job, and we need to penalize the cutters who are not doing a good job. The same thing comes in proportionality. Now, this is just a cursory look at the stone. We're not doing measurements like we would normally do with diamonds. We're simply looking at the stone 
and trying to see if um, there are any proportionality problems with the stones. So for example, do we have a shallow uh, crown height or, or a very high crown height? Do we have a bulge factor? Do we have a very thick girdle? Um, do we have an unacceptable table, so a very large table? Do we have problems with the symmetry? And we also want to look at the finish of the stone, which is the overall polish and the symmetry of the facets, but we only make deductions based on um, if these are very, uh, very poor, uh, actually fair or poor in terms of the classification for it. Um, most systems will use a worksheet. Um, the Jemmy Wizard system, a digital system, actually uh, you input, input all the information into their program and, and they'll do all the calculations for you. Now, I'm not advocating that we do this for every single stone. I mean, God forbid we have a five carat blue topaz and we go through this entire process for a, for a blue topaz. But one of the things that we need to do as a valuer is sometimes we need to justify our prices. And this is one way to justify the logic that we have used to arrive at that particular price. So again, looking at the colorwise system, we are going to derive a color score, which is the, the, the initial score that we start out with. We're going to make adjustments based on the clarity. We're going to make adjustments based on the cut. And we're going to end up with a final score. Now, what do we do with that final score? Good question. Well, we go back to our handy dandy um, uh, pricing chart. Um, and now, in order to calculate the value, we simply go to the subcategory that represents the final score. So if let's say that final score is an eight, we're going to go to this particular column. This is the only column that we're interested in. We're not interested in the other columns. So we've now taken this whole price list and we've, we've refined it to one particular column. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna find the correct weight. The third thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, find the correct price per carat. And voila, we have the actual final price for the stone. Now, one of the questions that I'm asked all the time by, by students and also by, by customers is treatments and enhancements. When do we need to be concerned about treatments and enhancements? Well, my general rule of thumb is if the price this you, that you are using makes that distinction, so should you. Okay. So if, for example, we're using GemGuide, uh, and I would strongly re recommend that you do. Um, we can see here that if we're looking at their price guide for blue sapphires, they make a distinction between non-origin specific heat treated stones. They make a distinction between Burmese unenhanced stones and also Ceylon or Sri Lankan unenhanced stones. A nightmare for the average jeweler, for the average appraiser, because it is extremely hard to determine, first of all, where a stone has come from, but also whether the stone has been treated or not. But we can see here by the values that it's a very important consideration, something that we need to try to figure out. So this is why very often if we're dealing with an expensive stone, it needs to go to a lab. It needs to go to a lab that has sophisticated uh, technology that will allow us to determine whether this stone has been heat treated, or has been unenhanced. Remember our goal here is to come up with an accurate value for that particular gemstone. How can we do that unless we pay attention to these prices and do the proper testing for them? Now it's interesting when you look at GemGuide because when I started in the industry, um, very little information was out there about treatments. I'm sure that stones were being treated, but not to the extent that they're being treated today. Uh, so back then, we would actually make deductions if a stone had been treated. So for example, if we had an emerald that had been oiled, we would make a deduction for that. But times have changed, my friends. And now the benchmark is that we assume that every emerald has a moderate level of treatment and we, we, we reward the stones that have not been treated. This is what's happened in our industry in the 42 years that I've been around that we now accept a moderate level of treatment and we reward a stone that is not being treated. Country of origin. Wow, what an explosive topic this is. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you give a person two diamonds, there is absolutely no way that we can determine where those diamonds have come from. 
obviously now with the situation in the world, that has become a consideration. But unless we follow the chain of warranties, it's absolutely impossible for us to know where these two diamonds have come from. But when it comes to colored stones, yes, in some cases, we do need to make this distinction. And once again, the rule of thumb is the price that you're working with, if it makes the distinction so much due. So if again, we go to gem guide and we look at the emeralds, we can see that there is actually a difference between Colombian, Zambian and Brazilian emeralds. Now, before I give you the difference in, in the price, my personal opinion, I don't like country of origin. Uh, first of all, it's beyond the reach of most, uh, most appraisers. Um, it's only uh, really possible to determine country of origin if you're working with highly sophisticated equipment. From a personal standpoint, if we have two emeralds that are exactly the same hue, exactly the same saturation, exactly the same lightness, exactly the same uh, degree of inclusions, exactly the same cut, exactly the same weight, uh, I would argue that they should be the same price. However, as we can see here, if we're working with a five carat extra fine Colombian emerald compared to a Brazilian emerald, there will be a difference of 28,500 US dollars in the wholesale price. And I would suspect that if I were the owner of that Colombian emerald, uh, perhaps country of origin would be a consideration from my standpoint, because clearly it does make a huge difference in the actual price. So that, my friends, is my presentation. I promised you 45 minutes. I'm three minutes over. Um, I'm going to hand it now back to Nicole, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so please feel free to log in and, um, and ask some questions. So Stu has asked about um, how do we handle fancy cuts? Well, um, Again, it depends on the actual cut. You know, there, there are cutters out there, and again, I look back to Victor Tuzlukov and, and um, uh, Michael Diver um, and, uh, and John Dyer, um, who are coming up with some fantastic uh, cuts. Um, but to be honest, these are, these are becoming branded cuts. Uh, and so from a valuation standpoint, uh, now it's not enough sometimes to just look at a stone and value it for what you see it is. It's the same thing that if we were valuing a Cartier ring, that we need to factor in something there in terms of, of the actual workmanship that's gone into that particular stone. Um, but in general, if we're looking at, at different, um, uh, you know, different uh, normal gemstones, um, really it's a question of taste. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll find that the shape that's being used on the stone um, is directly linked to our desire to retain weight in the stone. Um, but certainly when it comes to some of these designer fancy cuts, uh, yes, it requires some research to find out who cut the stone and then to factor in uh, additional value. As Victor once said to me, you wouldn't ask a, uh, a sculptor how much he paid for the marble. Um, and so it's the same thing when you're cutting 500 facets on a particular stone. Uh, the actual value of the material um, is something, but you also have to factor in um, the, the workmanship that's involved as well. Um, we've got a question here. Um, how do you determine color while dealing with international traders for gemstones? Um, well, the key here is communication. Um, and we're working now in a very different world. We're working um, on the internet a lot. There are a lot of uh, internet sites that sell gemstones. The crucial thing here is that the seller needs to communicate to the buyer exactly what they're going to get. And this is the challenge. This is certainly the challenge when it comes to colored stones, because as we know with social media, you get a customer upset and it's very, very easy for that, for that person to go online uh, and cause a lot of problems. Uh, at the same token, we want to foster good relationships with our customers, so we don't want any unpleasant surprises. Uh, so from that standpoint, it's important that we use proper terminology. So I know a lot of you out there probably like the terms pig uh, pigeon blood red and robin's egg blue, but the reality is these are terms that are, um, they're, 
they're hard to define. You know, if we had, um, you know, if, if we had uh, five people in a room and we asked those five people to define pigeon blood red, I can guarantee you that every single person would be different. So in answer to your question, uh, when dealing with international traders, you need to be communicating with the same system or at least with systems that actually speak to each other. Um, another question, how is the stones from old jewelry being valued or revalued? Well, this is an interesting question because in the, in the old days, uh, I don't want to make myself seem too old, but in the, in the old days when it came to diamonds, uh, we would actually work out recut values on the stone. So we'd take an old European cut stone and we would estimate what that stone would be in terms of, of a modern brilliant cut stone. We do that to some extent when it comes to colored stones, because if we want to level the playing field, we can do a hypothetical recut of, of a particular colored stone and come up with what would that stone weigh if it had been cut to proper proportions. Um, but in terms of, of old jewelry, again, we're, we're looking at uh, the hue, we're looking at the clarity, we're looking at saturation, we're looking at the tonal level, and we're also looking at the actual cut. Um, do all systems end up at a similar endpoint in value? How accurate are the pricing grids? Okay, this is, this is a good question. Um, no, they don't all end up at the same endpoint uh, in, in terms of value. They're all slightly different and not radically different, but they are, they are all slightly uh, different. How accurate are the pricing grids? Well, the problem with pricing grids is that they, they are based on obviously research, but for the most part, they are hypothetical prices. Um, the only true way that we can value something is between a willing buyer and a willing seller. So if I have a ruby uh, and you agree to buy that ruby off me for $1,000, that is the price for that particular ruby. But we have to have a starting out point. Um, I always say to people when it comes to valuing gemstones that after we've arrived at a value, there is a point of reflection. And that point of reflection will be based on your experience. So we go to the worksheet, we, we do all the calculations, and then we take a moment of reflection. And we say, is $1,000 a carat fair for that particular stone? We draw on our experience. You know, experience is not something you can buy. Experience is something that you earn. So after 42 years, yes, I can look at a price and I can say that seems like a fair price or it doesn't seem like a fair price. At the end of the day, you need to justify in your own mind why you arrived at that particular price. And this is why it's important to go through a particular system, to go through a worksheet, so that if you are asked to justify that price, you're able to actually do that. Um, here's another question. Why do you think it is that values worldwide have not adopted a universal system for color grading? Good question, good question. Um, you know, I'm somewhat hypocritical because for years I um, criticized the fact that there were so many systems out there. As an educator and as an author, very often when we want to explain something to a student or to a reader, we have to dissect it. We have to break it down into its basic parts and then rebuild it. And oftentimes when we break it down and we rebuild it, we realize that it made a lot of sense. For example, if we look at diamonds, D being the highest color. Now, who came up with that? I understand why we came up with that, but to, to a consumer, that doesn't make any sense at all. And when you have a student and you try to explain that, and they ask, what's the logic behind that? Well, there is no logic at all. So when I created ColorWise, I created as a hybrid system, taking what I believed were the best and most logical parts from the existing systems, so I wasn't interested in building a new wheel. I was simply trying to make the, the existing wheel a little bit better. Um, and judging by uh, the results that we have had with, with ColorWise in terms of consistency uh, in the classes that we've held, we're, we're averaging uh, between 90 and 92% uh, consistency in the grades, um, which tells me that, that we're, we're onto the right track. But 
Um, yes, wouldn't it be lovely if we had a universal system for color grading, not just colored gemstones, but also uh, diamonds, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, time for a couple more questions. Um, we've got a question here from Eleanor. She says, my question is related to country of origin for the same quality stone, example, the Emerald from Colombia, Zambia, and Brazil. Why Colombian stones are more expensive? Is it due to historic sites, rarity, or something else? Good question. Um, historically, yes, fine emeralds came from Colombia, but this is my this is my bone of contention with, with country of origin. If we have two things that are exactly the same, why are we making a distinction based on the country of origin? And what we're doing here by creating these massive price differences is that we are encouraging people to be dishonest. So as I said earlier, the seven magical letters that spell out Myanmar or Burmese, labs are under tremendous pressure to put the, that word on that particular document because it'll have a huge impact on the actual price. So what happens is if we have people, every single ruby they have is Burmese. I was in Sri Lanka and I saw so many Padparaja sapphires. They weren't Padparaja sapphires at all, but because of the significance and the value added to using the word Padparaja, everybody had Padparaja sapphires. So, I believe, and this is only my personal opinion, so please don't send me uh, uh, you know, emails or hate emails. I believe that if we went on grading stones based on the actual quality that's sitting in front of us, that we would avoid a lot of problems that we have in the trade by dishonesty, by people over grading stones, by people trying to get added value into those particular stones. Um, so one last question, um, and this one here is, what is the process to identify the origin of gemstones? Well, you require incredibly sophisticated uh, equipment that is uh, very expensive. It's beyond the reach of most, certainly most appraisers, most jewelers. Um, it is one of the reasons why labs exist, um, and they exist because of this huge differential in the actual prices. Um, but it's, it's a complex thing. Uh, in some cases, we can tell by inclusions, by mineral inclusions that, they, uh, that this stone has come from a certain geological formation. Um, we can also tell sometimes by the chemical constituents, but it's not easy. Um, and while some people will say that they can look at two emeralds and tell you where they came from, um, I suspect that that's not always true. Um, so, very difficult in terms of doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gio, for sharing your valuable time and expertise. And I think this has been a very engaging webinar and uh, there's been a lot of active participation. So we'd also like to thank the audience for uh, being very active throughout the session. Uh, and we hope that you enjoyed the session and can use the knowledge uh, to your advantage in your respective businesses. Thank you once again. And if you all have any questions, you can email it at info at gematlas.com and we will share the same with Mr. Gio. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.